Hi everybody, welcome back to SuperCloud 7. We're here live all day in our Palo Alto studios. We're kind of wrapping up toward the end of, of day one. Uh, uh, Benoit Dajaville is going to do the closing keynote. We're super excited, he's in the house. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host for this segment, George Gilbert, and Moham Aref is here. He's the CEO of Relational AI. Moham, great to see you again. Thanks Hi, for Dave. coming into our studio. Thanks for having me, thanks. We've had some wonderful conversations, you, George, and myself over the past you know, year or so, even actually going way back. Yes, you know, as 2016, you yeah. Yeah, 2016 yeah. At, uh, at Infor. Uh, otherwise known as Inforical, for those of you who like <laughs> the inside baseball. Uh, <laughs> but we've really uh, talked about the progression and the evolution of the data stack, the so-called modern data platform. Uh, we want to talk about silo busting, right? I mean, we have just built silo after silo in this data space. Are we finally, is there light at the end of the tunnel in terms of being able to consolidate those silos and being able to, to it more, in a more facile way, get value out of our data, where are we? Yeah, great question. It's uh, one of my favorite topics and I think uh, we're finally ready to sort of talk about that because we've had to go through a progression uh, over the last I don't know, uh, 10 years maybe, um, uh, fighting out in the new world, who's going to own the database engine in, the, in this sort of modern data stack, this un, uh, unpacked uh, world. Uh, so I think that's played out. I think. Uh, I feel very comfortable saying that Snowflake won uh, that, and then who's going to own the data pipelines? Uh, I think Databricks, you can argue, has sort of won that. I think Databricks is trying to uh, challenge uh, Snowflake on the uh, database side, and of course Snowflake and uh, tools like DBT are trying to challenge um, Databricks in terms of the data pipelines and how do you manage that. Um, more recently, we've had the wars, the data format wars, because people wanted to unbundle uh, the data formats and, and open them up so that people can mix and, and match. And we had Hoodie and Delta and Iceberg. I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, Iceberg won that. And, and right now, the catalog wars are uh, you know, in full, full on, and people are talking about unbundling the catalogs that used to sit you know, in each of these uh, uh, technologies. And so as that shapes out, I think the next layer and the, the answer to your question about applications, the next layer is about semantics. Where do you put application logic and semantics in this new world? And where do you put it in a world that where people are asking um, to rethink applications in, in, in terms of intelligent applications, okay? So it's not you know, your, your grandfather's Java code or C-sharp code that you're gonna somehow put in the catalog. Uh, you're building intelligent applications. By definition, these applications have to look at data. And the old architectures where you're moving a few records of data over to some Java to do something to book you an airline seat, that doesn't work anymore. Uh, you're, you're now doing things that require you to predict and you need to look at lots of data. And so the new architectures are going to move the semantics and the business logic to the data. And uh, my view is that that business logic is, is going to have to change uh, to fit in the modern data stack. And of course, the, the, the paradigm, the underlying par paradigm of data in the modern data stack is relational. And I think business logic and semantics have to be expressed relationally so they can coexist with the data, okay? So catalogs, semantics, I think, are the next two major battles. And explain what you mean by semantics, because sometimes people hear that term and it's sort of fuzzy to them. It, it is. Uh, and and it's, it, sometimes we take liberties with the term. So yeah. let's, let's dig into that a little bit. Yeah, I think like, yeah, it's unfortunate that this is, these are the terms that are sticking, semantic layers, or sometimes you hear people uh, you know, use terms like ontologies and things like that. I think that's way, uh, uh, way too complex or way, way it's not helpful. So uh, let's talk about that. Let's say I have uh, uh, information about uh, people in my database. And let's say there's an entry for Dave, an entry for George, an entry for Mulham. I might track our names. I might track our addresses. I might track our birthdays. At some point, I might want to compute something off of that. For example, I might want to compute our ages from our birthdays. Okay, now I can just add an extra column and key in our ages, but that's not good because I'm going to keep, you know, as time passes, I'm going to have to keep updating our ages, you know, as we all get older. Uh, and so instead of uh, just storing the raw data, I might put in a bit of business logic that says a person's age is equal to today minus their date of birth. And anytime someone needs to look up any of our ages, okay, I will just apply the semantics, the business logic, the formula, 
historically that was written in COBOL or Java or C Sharp or something like that. And I'm saying in the future, you'll want to write it relationally. You want to write it as a relational query. Now, what if I want more uh, involved predictive intelligence semantics? Like I'm trying to calculate how long it's going to take to ship you a product to your home, because I have your home address, OK, from someplace in China. OK, that might involve like modeling out a whole supply chain right. and might involve doing something predictive, you know, using some fancy probabilistic or statistical model, might involve solving some kind of linear program or integer program to optimize the route of the package from China to your house. And that is intelligent semantics. That's not something you can write in, you know, A equals B plus C. You need the building blocks that let you predict and optimize to be able to define those semantics, okay? Does that Almost make sense? As, yes, it does. Almost like it's self-composing, and that's where you get intelligence, and then of course building applications on top of that. And we'll yeah. we'll get into that. Uh, go ahead, George. But just to to sort of solidify that, uh, um, it sounds like we we created this layer 50 years ago was the first research on a relational database where we said, okay, let's share how we're going to store data, standardize it. Now what you're saying is. If we need to build all these different types of apps that use not just data, but they have to share the meaning and the logic, the business logic around the data, we need another layer that um, that captures all the business logic in a shareable way, not siloed in the application. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're, we're getting at. But what I, I'm understanding you to say is it can't be oh, we're just going to have a new programming language that was an app server. And that only got us so far because that was yeah. kind of fused to a particular kind of application. Yeah. So what is it that's so hard about capturing not only all the logic in a shareable way, but all the analytics? Yeah, so I think it's really good to go back 50 years and to remind ourselves of why people pick the architectures that we have today. It's sort of like, um, I don't know, Stockholm syndrome or something like this architecture that we were forced to live with has become the norm. And you know, we like our captors, right? And uh, this architecture is all about managing to the constraints of the technology that we had 50 years ago. And then we had really until the modern data stack came along and we, we started producing more scalable systems. And for a variety of reasons, we couldn't build a, an application that was uh, uh, able to capture everything in one place. So we had to split it up and federate it. A component of the application is the database and you have to worry about the data model. And it was in, uh, you know, ultimately that ended up being relationally uh, implemented. And because the relational databases at the time were not powerful enough and scalable enough and their pricing models were such that they were too expensive to actually run the business logic, as a workaround, we pulled that in logic out. We implemented by hand procedurally because we didn't have the relational language that it could express it declaratively, okay? Yeah. And we had to live with this sort of two brain architecture where the database had no idea what the application logic was doing and the application logic didn't understand databases. And so uh, it was a kludge, okay? okay. And so, uh, but it's a kludge because we had technological and business constraints that don't exist today. And so if you revis revisit the problem from first principles, kind of like we did with electric cars, someone said, okay, why did, we, why did electric car cars not work out in 1910? Uh, why are we still doing all this combustion engine stuff? And they went back and looked, oh, it was the batteries. Uh, well, do we still have those problems with the batteries? No. So let's rethink the, 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 the system. And so we have the same thing here. We can actually, we have the scalability, the architectures and the algorithms and data structures now to actually de define it in an end-to-end -end so, uh, so that it's, uh, you can analyze across the data aspects and the semantics or the business. And level. the machines can do that. To decludge before, you had to have people with, you know. Yeah, and, well, and now you have language models and things like that. You can look at all the places semantics exist because they exist in application code in Java and COBOL and C Sharp, but they also exist in spreadsheets. Yeah. They also exist in uh, SQL queries. They exist in people's heads. They exist in documents, right? And so you want to pull all of that out and put create a common a set of assets that capture what a business knows about itself in an artifact that everyone in the business, whether it's people running the business or new types of agents that we create to help you run the business, we all have a common view of what that business is about. So, so like geeks like me like, like to hear that. That's the you know, philosoph philosophical, um, bring it down to a concrete, like the first 
you know, use cases like the customer 360 or recommendation, but then generalize that to an end-to-end -end application and then how that end-to-end -end application might interoperate better with other end-to-end -end applications that are sharing this business logic substrate. Yeah, so look, because we had this application-centric architecture for the last 50 years, every time a business needed to do something, they rolled their new application. They had a database that had its own data model for that application. They built a bunch of Java code or whatever to you know, implement, uh, I don't know, online purchasing, okay, because we didn't have the internet before uh, in 1995 or whatever. And so you end up with enterprises. I think I saw actually on one of your shows, like the average enterprise has almost a thousand applications. Mm -hmm. I know of enterprises that have 43,000 applications that are driven by 17,000 different SQL databases and 400 million columns of data across those things. That's not uncommon. And it's an act of God to it, consolidate it, them yeah. and get rid of them. Yeah, so there's nothing like, I'm not proposing, uh, and no one's proposing, that you just do a big bang rewrite of all these things, but as you start sort of looking at application by application, a lot of people have legacy applications still running on mainframes and all that. So take, take the aspects of the application and start incrementally building a common ontology or common vocabulary, let's say, about speaking about your business. Well, I have customers. Are we going to call them customers or are we going to call them clients? We're going to call them customers. Uh, I have uh, a products. Are we going to call them items, products, SKUs, UPCs, articles? Let's, let's decide that this is our, our convention. And then you start building a little uh, um, model of the business with common terms like that. And slowly, slowly you refactor away from an application-centric architecture to more data and knowledge-centric uh, architecture, and you lose a lot of technical complexity in the process because you're you're simplifying things down to their essence, and you're not having to like redundantly or create all this redundancy across a uh, thousand or ten thousand applications. Would it be fair to say then that you start um, you start optimizing for decisions you want to make in the context of a process, and the legacy applications almost become um, device drivers or data models. Yeah. They don't go away, but, but now you can optimize across processes. Yeah, when you have 1,000 applications or worse, 10,000 applications, you're not going to, that's not all going to go away overnight. And some of these applications will live forever because it's not worth, uh, you know, uh, uh, moving them. And so you, this, in this world where you have a common ontology, common model, I don't want to use fancy words like ontology and semantics, but uh, a common model of your business, then that model becomes something you can use to interface with legacy and to actually create the new, you know, uh, agent-based, agentic, language model-driven things, and it all coexists in the same context using this model of your business as a, as a, as a way of having us understand each other. And, and if I may, Earlier today, we heard Jamak Dagani from an interview that George and I did, just describe that that essentially was one big giant asynchronous batch job, that by the time you got to data and, and insights, everything in the market had changed. So my question is, is can that vision in the near to midterm be done in essentially in real time? The vision of uh, uh, modeling out a business? Yes, or, yes. And what you described with the legacy yeah. systems and the analytic systems and the agents. Yeah making decisions yeah. and taking action. People have already, like independently of anything uh, we discussed today, people are already putting all their data on Snowflake, for example. And so that was like a huge step forward because now I have a scalable database system where everything can go in one place and I can manage it you know, with SQL and you know, relationally and so on. Now, of course, the, as soon as you do that, you realize, well, my, the, my, the, the consumer of that data doesn't want to have to go fish across 100 tables to get one view of a customer. I want to actually create a common view. And so people started writing SQL to define cleaner and cleaner versions of the underlying data, data, and that became an attempt at building a semantic layer. And so people are rolling these things as they, as just for data, forget applications, they're starting to move semantics there so that people who just want raw data have a common view of customer, common view of supplier, 
common view of uh, employees, common view of all these core concepts in, in a business. And now they're saying, okay, well, I have all this information. Why don't I add more and more semantics, more and more business logic, so I can predict, for example, when a product is going to get to my customer, or I can predict what what product to recommend to a customer based on what other customers have been doing. But, but I have to challenge something that you said there. You said people are putting all their data into Snowflake, but when you talk to companies like we had earlier, TransUnion on or a Walmart, they might have a little bit of Snowflake, a little bit of Databricks. They got AWS, they sure. got Google, they got Azure. Uh, 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 they got Oracle, uh, they're, they're not going to put all their data into, into Snowflake. Sure. So how do you square that circle? So I use Snowflake here as a, as a sort of a proxy for uh, this kind of stack. And I think what people have realized is, you know, uh, just for pricing negotiations, you need to have at least a couple of these systems in your, in your world so that you can make sure you're not like, uh, at a disadvantage when it comes to, uh, time to uh, contract negotiations. So maybe you know, put your data in Iceberg, okay, as a proxy for that, and you use the best engine at the time. And so today I would argue Snowflake has the best engine and you can use that for 70, 80% of what you want to do, but then you can include other technologies that complement Snowflake, maybe like ours for workloads it doesn't support, or other technologies that maybe do what Snowflake does, but give you some level of independence so that you're not overly reliant, okay? But I think we all agree it's all going into these open table formats one way or another, whether you, you consume it with one vendor's engine or multiple vendors. As the data shows that, the recent survey we did showed about 70% of the respondents said they're sort of leaning that way. You know, not, not a ton are adopting it today, but yeah. they're all head in that direction. Yeah. And iceberg is very clearly. And again, I think even if you're like, you know, a Fortune 100 enterprise, yeah. and you might say, I want to use the proprietary formats or whatever, you still want the iceberg to exist because you still want to be able to negotiate with that in, in the background. All right, George, why don't you wrap up your- Okay, so if I were to re recap, like we centralized a lot of data in data lakes, whether it's Snowflake, Databricks or others, um, and we use data products to start trying to abstract some of the semantics into the end products. But what you do, starting with Snowflake, but not limited to them just today, can be limited to others, take an open data format, and then build these concepts up into richer semantics, and now adding the business process definitions and the analytics on top, yeah. so that you are the next layer above today's attempt at harmonizing data, you will harmonize, unify, and add the, dyna the, the kinetics and essentially dynamics um, of the business. And then when that happens, then we can have decision-centric and um, analytic-centric or analytic-driven applications that are not bound by um, silos. That, would that be That's a- That's right, we don't want our intelligent applications to be written in the bad old way, right? We yeah. want, if you want a, a column of information that says what are Georgia's you know, favorite uh, uh, products or favorite color for the next car he's going to buy, you don't want to have to pull the data out in some other system, compute that with some thing, and then write back you know, blue or red yeah. or whatever your favorite color is going to be, right? You want the data system itself to be able to define that, and that's what I mean by moving the the semantics. In this case, you're not computing your age, you're computing something that requires the system to understand your entire shopping history, everything you bought, everything it knows about you to be able to come up with a prediction that George likes to, to, you know, to buy red cars. So we entered last decade with Hadoop. Uh, we exited with the modern data platform. We entered this decade with the modern data platform. Will we exit to, to the next data platform prior to the end of this decade or will it be into the next decade? No, I think we still have more to unbundle, yeah. right? We talked about, you know, the, the open formats and the catalogs and the semantics and all of that. A lot of work to do. There's still, I think, and there's still, I don't know, we, I don't, you have better numbers than me, is it like 30% adoption of, there's still more adoption of cloud computing and the modern data stack and the, I, 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 cloud I think is bigger than some of the cloud vendors would have you believe. Yeah, because um, they want a bigger town. Yes, <laughs> of course, yeah, absolutely. I think that's throwing telco in there, so maybe that, yeah. you know, if you do that. But, um, but yeah, but, but to your point, it's, it, it's, it's not trivial. It's going to yeah. take some time. I think, yeah, I think easily the rest of this decade, yeah. yeah. Malam, thanks so much, George. Great to have you back. Thank you both. All right, it's always it. a pleasure. Okay, keep it right there. We'll be back to wrap up SuperCloud 7, our closing keynote with Benoit Dajaville. Uh, you're watching SuperCloud 7 live from Palo Alto and on demand. Right back. <laughs>